Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. To God be the glory. Day number 99 out of 100. I don't even know. I'm speechless. I am in awe of all that God has done these 99 days. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I might just hear this cry for the next 30 for <laughs> tomorrow, day 100. To God be the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Wow. Man, I'm telling you all, I'm just so thankful and grateful uh, to what the Lord has done to know we are getting through uh, this 100 days of the essential Jesus daily devotional with you all, with this August body of believers, with this anointed and highly favored body of believers. Just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for his excellent greatness, for his wonder. And we just stand here in awe of his goodness, his grace and his mercy. Well, family, today we're looking at the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, 1 through 19. We're going to look at his conversion experience and wow, just wow. So first of all, shout out to everybody on the live stream on this Tuesday evening, April the 18th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Praise the Lord. I want to say what's up to Frank and Lisa and Audrey. Who else? I see the Thompsons, Nikita and Larry. Praise the Lord. That dynamic duo. And to everybody who watches the live stream, watches the rebroadcast, that is. Just want to say God bless you as well. We've had a few new subscribers to the YouTube channel. So I just want to say God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Praise the Lord. Well, family, we're going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive on into the word of God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just stand here in awe of you. There are no words to express our appreciation for your goodness and your mercy and grace. No words to express all that the Holy Spirit is doing in us and through us and for us. Lord, we thank you for your sustaining power. Lord, I thank you for taking an idea that was off the top of my head and you turned it into an encounter with you. You turned it into an, an experience. You turned it into a moment of transformation as we behold the beauty of the Lord, as we behold the glory of the Lord, and we are being renewed, we are being refreshed, we are being revived in our inner man. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing. I speak a word of blessing over every believer who has participated, whether great or small, for everyone who's attended the live stream, participated in the YouVersion Bible app, or watched the Bree broadcast. I hope, Lord God, you have touched them in a mighty and in a miraculous way. And we just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. And as we take a look at Saul's encounter, Lord, I thank you for everyone who had an encounter with you. Because it doesn't have to be as spectacular as Saul, but it doesn't mean it has any less meaning. It is just as important for every soul that has come into the kingdom of God. Because there's no little eyes and no big use. Everybody's encounter and experience with you, Lord God, is monumental because you changed us. You molded us, you reshaped us, you transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into your marvelous light. And we stand here as children of the day. We stand here as having received eternal life. And we stand here anticipating what is to come, the resurrection. We anticipate the eternal state, the eternal kingdom of God. Father, as always, brood over us, 
Saturate the atmosphere with your glory and with your anointing. Let the words of scripture, Lord God, leap off the page and into our hearts and into our minds and let us obey your scriptures. We thank you for all that you're doing, both seen and unseen. In Jesus name, amen and amen. Well, family, let's take a look at Paul or Saul. Uh, and we're going to start off with a little bit of a biography a little bit of details about Paul's life. And we're going to break this up into two sections. I've got Saul, the antagonist, and Paul, the protagonist. So that's how we're going to look at this today. And uh, we're going to go ahead and dive on in. Praise the Lord. So let's go ahead and look at a little bit of Saul, the antagonist. Of course, antagonist meaning enemy. So he first appears in the book of Acts. Let me go back a little bit. Let's see if I got my right thing here. Oh, you came on the first one. So he first, Paul was born in Tarsus, a Hellenistic city in the Roman province of Sicilia in modern Turkey. So Paul is a Roman citizen because he was born in Tarsus, which was a territory owned by the Romans. He was born as Saul and as a Roman citizen, of course. Now, Saul is his name referred to in Rome. So it's kind of a Roman name for him. Uh, Paul does not in any way make a connection to his transformation. Uh, Paul was just normally what he was referred to under his Jewish identity. So Saul, because Saul and Paul uh, even Paul referred to himself as Saul sometimes. So it's not like when God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Uh, it's just his identity to both as a Roman citizen and as a Jew. So Paul descends from the tribe of Benjamin. He learned the trade of tent making when he was young, which later supported him during his missionary journey. And Paul studied under the well-known rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem and eventually became a Pharisee himself. He first appears in the book of Acts after the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And Paul silently stood witnessing, uh, witness to the stoning and approved of the killing. So we already see uh, where Paul is in the story. Following this act, Paul committed himself to destroying the church and received authority from the high priest to pursue Christians outside of Jerusalem to bring them back as prisoners. Paul's quest to eradicate the church created widespread fear among early Christian believers. Paul was a terrorist, a gangster, a thug, whatever analogy you want to put. But Paul was on this mission to stamp out this movement, to stamp out believers. And so this is where we pick up the story. And so Acts chapter 9, verse 1, but Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. Now, the reason he was going to Damascus, we know from the historian Josephus, there was a population of Jews in that area, approximately about 18,000. We don't know how the church uh, matriculated to Damascus, possibly on the day of Pentecost, because you had people from all around the diaspora who were there to celebrate. And of course, we know 3,000 were saved. And so possibly as people went back to their various regions uh, like Damascus, that could be where some of the believers uh, went to. And so there is some Christians that are there and Paul is going to go to Damascus. And there must be uh, a significant 
amount of believers there, uh, enough so much that Paul wants to go way to Damascus, which was several days away. I think it's six by foot, you know, probably two or three by horseback. Uh, so he wants to get these letters and get the authority so that he may be found any belonging to the way. So the way is what they called believers, Christians, believers in Jesus Christ. And so men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now he went on his way. He approached Damascus and suddenly... So, like I said, this is a several day journey trip. Paul, of course, by his own admission, was very zealous for the law. So, you know, during this trip, he's got his plan. He's got his scheme. He's going to go into Damascus. He's going to go around like he's a private eye or investigator, go into the synagogues, talking to the other Jews, trying to sniff out and to find out where anyone who believes in Jesus so that he can arrest them. He has a one track mind. I imagine as he can see Damascus in the distance his heart starts racing. You know, his blood pressure goes up. His eyes begin to narrow. He's got his shackles. He's got his chains and he's prepared. He's got his boys with him. And suddenly without warning, without pretense, without any inkling, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And verse four says, and falling to the ground. <laughs> because Paul at this point was the man in charge. He was the one who was leading this crusade. He has authority. He has the backing of the high priest. And now he has been knocked down to the ground. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Of course, Saul, Saul is often an indication of emotion, right? It's something that's being stressed or being emphasized. Why are you persecuting me? Because to persecute the church is to persecute Jesus because we are his body. So be very careful. <laughs> how you handle the saints because uh, we are the body of Christ. And so to attack a believer is to attack Jesus himself. Now, Paul says something in verse five. He says, who are you, Lord? Now, Lord, during this time period was a, oftentimes a a word of respect. It was almost the equivalent of saying, sir. So he's not saying Lord in terms of Jesus lordship and divinity, but clearly he's recognized there's a higher authority that has just addressed him. So out of respect, he says, Lord. And he said, and Jesus responds says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Now to Paul, this had to be shocking. Because imagine, we, we see Paul's pedigree. Paul spoke multiple languages. He was very intelligent. And Paul because of his zeal for the law, knew absolutely he was in the right. He was totally convinced. He was totally persuaded. And now to find out that everything you have believed for your entire life is completely wrong. He had to be in a tizzy. I mean, his head had to have been spinning in order to have 
this suddenly a counter with Jesus. Um, I remember I was watching a movie. I think it was, why did I get married? And the character, I think it was Malik Yoba, right? He gets into this huge argument with uh, his wife, which was, uh, what's her name? Uh, the Jackson girl, I can't think of her name. Janet Jackson, her role. And he, and he gets all upset, right? He gets into this huge fight. He gets in his car, right? And he's heated in this high emotional scene and he spurts and he spins out into the street and bam, he gets broadsided by a car. I was like, whoa! I mean, so it's that kind of encounter. And he was in a Porsche, too. I mean, could you have picked another car, like a Ford Escort or something? Why I got to be a Porsche? But anyway, it's that kind of shock to Paul's system, a shock to his theology, a shock to his doctrine to find out that this Jesus is, in fact, real. And now he has had this incredible encounter with the Lord. He says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. And to get a little bit more insight as to what happened here, as to what Paul experienced, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. So this is 1 Corinthians 15, chapter uh, verse 3. It says, for I delivered you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. He appeared also to me. So Paul saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And what did John say when he saw a vision that, no, he shined brighter than the noonday sun. So that brilliance, that glory, that light he saw had an encounter with the resurrected Lord. And so this is what Paul is experiencing. In verse seven, and the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but not seeing anyone. So Saul arose from the ground and though his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. When he showed up on the road to Damascus, when he was on his way, I'm sure Paul had a clear vision. <laughs> he knew exactly what was going to happen. He was very sure of himself. I'm sure he was very confident in his mission. And now that he has been knocked off his horse, if he was on a horse, uh, and now that he can't see, he is blind. His eyes were open and saw nothing. So now he's being led. The one who was leading is now the one who is being led. Such a role reversal through these scriptures as he has run smack dab into the power of God. And so he is being brought uh, by the hand. He is led to Damascus. Now he is being led like a child. The man who was once proud, the one who was highly intellectual, the one who had dual citizenship, the one who sat at the seat of the best teachers is now being led away like a child. And for three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So I can imagine Paul's head is hurting over these three days as he is grappling with the reality that Jesus the Christ is real and that he is alive and that this encounter is going to change Paul for the rest of his life. This encounter is so important, it changed our life because Paul is the one who describes the church. Paul is the one who gives us the majority of New Testament doctrine. And here we are thousands of years later on a Tuesday night reading this encounter 
about his life. So in verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And this is going to be a very important point here. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. Fun fact, that street called Straight is still in existence today. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Oh, I bet Paul is praying now. Uh, and I guarantee you, these aren't the religious prayers of the Jews that he got. Uh, he recited all of his life. The, 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 the Jews prayed all the time. They prayed multiple times a day. They prayed when they had a festival or a feast or for this thing or for that thing. So, so there was a whole lot of praying going on throughout Paul's life. But he is really praying now. Because how many of us knew the Lord's prayer as a heathen, <laughs> as sinners? We all knew the Lord's prayer. We all, if you grew up going to church, especially if you was in the Baptist church, you knew the Lord's prayer. I could recite the Lord's prayer from memory and what nobody saved and was still going to the club and still doing whatever. But when I gave my life to Christ, now, my prayers were filled with something of a real substance. Prayers of relationship, prayers of real relationship with God. So he is praying now and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias. A man named Ananias come in and laying hands on him and say that he might regain his sight. Now, there's something in literature called situational irony. Situational irony. So what that means is, let's say, for example, a fire station catches fire and burns to the ground. Now, a fire station is supposed to be a place full of people who put out fires. But if a fire station catches fire and burns to the ground, right, that's situational irony. Now, Paul is persecuting the church. He's persecuting the way. He's having them arrested and ultimately some are killed. So the very thing that Paul is persecuting is what Jesus is now going to use to deliver him. So he's going to deliver people to prison. And now Jesus selects somebody in the church, somebody in the way who is now going to go and lay hands on Paul. So now Jesus is using the church to now bring deliverance to Paul, who at one point, it, at one point wanted to stamp out the church. Situational irony. So he's using Ananias to do this. But Ananias said, now hold up, Lord. <laughs> we heard about this dude. We know what's all about. He, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Know how he says to your saints. And here he has authority. Well, Ananias, he did have authority because the one who had ultimate authority stripped him of his and now he is submitted. So the authority that he once had is no longer valid. It is null and void. Whatever authority he got from the tree, from the high priest is no longer valid because the one who has supreme higher and ultimate authority has now arrested Paul. So Paul, who was on his way to arrest Christians, now himself has been arrested by the Lord and been, has now been subdued. So the authority he had from the high priest to blind, bind all who call on your name. But the Lord says, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine. 
to carry out my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And man, did Paul suffer. So let's let's take a look at some of the sufferings that he endured. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to start at verse 24. So this is all the things Paul had went through for the sake of Christ. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one or 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and am I not weak? Who is made of fall and am I not indignant? So Paul had to suffer a lot. Uh, and I wouldn't advise anybody to pray for the anointing that Paul has on his life because all you ready to suffer <laughs> what Paul is had to suffer in order to receive the level of revelation that he has. And so he suffered immensely and greatly uh, for the sake of Jesus Christ. In verse 17, so Ananias, he goes and to find Paul to lay hands on him. Now, I'm wondering how Ananias actually approached this situation. Was he like Brother Saul? The Lord who has appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight in the name of Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Was he like uh, uh, a brother Saul? Uh, the Lord Jesus appeared to you. Remember on, on the road to Damascus because Paul was a terrorist. And so even after Paul's conversion, you know, they kind of, you know, they felt some type of way still with Paul. But. This is an important encounter for Paul because he's meeting the, he calls him brother. He says, brother Saul. So the love of the church is now embracing somebody who was once attacking it. And I believe Jesus orchestrates this whole scenario with Ananias so that Paul can see what the church is really supposed to be about. And so he's met with somebody who is going to honor the authority under the direction of Jesus. He is, he approaches Paul and he says to him, brother, using that term of endearment in order to um, bring forth his deliverance. Then in verse 18, it says immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. It didn't say it was scales, but something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. And this whole idea of blindness and Paul receiving his sight of course, is all as a result of this encounter with Jesus. So Jesus is responsible for Paul being blinded. And Jesus is responsible for him receiving his sight. Uh, because clearly Paul, although he was able to see prior to this conversion, he was blinded by his view of the law. He was blinded by his zeal to try to stamp out Christians because he thought they were blaspheming. And so 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we kind of get a little bit more uh, clarity as to this whole idea of what was happening with Paul, uh, as well as the situation of the other Jews. Uh, because Paul starts talking about this veil that was on Moses' face. So, of course, Moses goes and spends 40 days with the Lord on the mountain. And when Moses comes down, the glory of God is emanating and reflecting off of his face. So much so that the, the people didn't want to come near him. And so what Moses did was Moses put a veil over his face to cover or to shroud the glory of God. And so, and Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 here. And I would read the whole chapter to get the whole context, but for the sake of time, I'm going to start at verse 13. He says, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Because the glory that Moses had on his face was symbolic of the glory of the Old Testament. It was the glory of the law. And that glory was fading. Because as you get closer to the cross, the glory of the Old Testament law is fading because it's going to be replaced with a greater glory, which is the New Testament. But Moses had this over his face and it was so that they would not see the fading of the law. So verse 14 says, but their minds were hardened. Speaking of the Israelites, for to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, meaning because eventually that glory on Moses face was going to fade away, just like the Old Testament law was going to fade away. But if the veil is on Moses face, you can't see or discern the fading of the law. So as the Jews are still reading the old covenant, that veil is still unlifted. So therefore, they were not able to recognize that the law had faded away because only through Christ is it taken away. So that veil that they had where they could not discern that the law had faded away. And now through Jesus blood, we have a new covenant. Only Jesus was able to take it away. And that was how Paul and the other Jews like him operated. They looked at the old covenant. They could not recognize that it had faded away that at the cross, there is a new covenant, a better covenant. There is a new glory. There is a greater glory that supersedes that of the old covenant. So Paul, in his zeal, is still going after those of the new covenant because the veil is still unlifted until he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And it is that encounter with the Lord that removes the veil so that Paul can now see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, it says, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So Paul is talking about his, his fellow Jews who have not been converted as they are still reading the Old Testament law that veil is still covering their hearts as it is today for the Jews who don't believe. Verse 16 says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And isn't that what happened to all of us when we couldn't see? I mean, I remember growing up, going to church and I'm just laughing. These old church folk up there dancing and all this other stuff until I got saved. <laughs> the veil from my face, from our eyes was now removed. And now I can see the Lord. Now I can see the scriptures. So all of us at one point, we were veiled. We could not see until the Lord saved us. And when the Lord saved us, 
the veil was lifted. Now we can see the kingdom. Now we can see Jesus for who he is. And so, but until then, the Lord is the one who has to remove it. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. <laughs> we often quote that verse, but here, that's, this is the context. And it says that we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Here is an amazing clue. When we behold the glory of the Lord, that is where true transformation takes place. As we behold the glory of the Lord in scripture, look, 99 days, we're about to hit 100 of us beholding the glory of the Lord Jesus. There has to be a transformation that takes place. As we behold the beauty of the Lord, as we behold his glory through prayer and through worship and through our obedience, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This is where transformation takes place. And this is the things the church no longer teaches. We talk about the glory of but we don't talk about how to behold the glory of the Lord. More marriages would be healed if the couples would behold the glory of the Lord. More people would be delivered if you just behold the glory of the Lord. There would be more revelation. There would be more anointing. There would be more power. There would be more healing if we only would just behold the glory of the Lord, because that is where transformation takes place. And I'm so thankful I had the opportunity to sit under teachers who taught beholding the glory of the glory of the Lord. Because that's where we are transformed, family. This is where the transformation takes place. This is when we start to reflect him. Because that's what Moses did on that mountain. And when he came down, that glory was a reflection of his time spent with the Lord. So as we spend this time with the Lord and we behold his beauty as we behold the scriptures, as we behold the working of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed. Praise the Lord. And that's what we need, a transformed church. Hallelujah. So now Paul, Saul, is no longer the antagonist. He has now been transformed because he has beheld the glory of the Lord. So now he is the protagonist. And so let's end this by looking at what Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verses five through 11, as he details this transformation. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. This is when he had that veil. That veil was covering Moses' face, and he could not see that the law had faded away. So he went about it as if the glory of the law was still revelant. Uh, verse 7 says, but... Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Let's go to the next verse here. Yep. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own. Remember, he said he was right under the law 
that comes from the law, but that which comes from through faith in Christ and righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul says, everything I knew prior to that, but I counted all as loss. And now the only thing that matters is Jesus. Amen and amen. What a miraculous transformation of Paul as the Lord has reshown himself because it is Paul who was going to teach and to preach church doctrine until we are still studying his words and we will continue to study it until the Lord comes back. Amen. Well, family, that is it for today's lesson. Paul, a transformed man to God be the glory. And certainly I appreciate all of our transformation as we continue to study. We continue to behold the beauty of the Lord as we continue to behold the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed. Until soon and very soon, we will see him face to face. And the Bible says, then we will be like him. Amen and amen. Well, family, man, that wraps up day number 99. Look at the ticker at the bottom of your screen because tomorrow is number one zero zero to God be the glory. Praise the Lord. Man, I can't hardly believe it, but the Lord has brought us a mighty long way. Well, family, I will be back here tomorrow on day number 100, Wednesday, April the 19th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as we will bring to conclusion our 100 Essential Jesus Daily Devotional. Now tomorrow I will announce uh, what is to come next because we're going to keep this train rolling. So of course I'm going to take a, a break. Not long. <laughs> it won't be like I need a month off. But uh, we're going to uh, start a new sort of devotional series. Uh, it won't be daily, but uh, I'll talk about that tomorrow and I'll give you a date as to when we'll start that for those who want to participate. It will be through the YouVersion Bible app. So the great thing is I can start it there and share it out with everybody. And then we will continue to continue to sharpen each other. We'll continue to stay in God's word and keep this train a rocking and a rolling. So, of course, all of the live streams are on YouTube or on the Facebook. So you can always go back and reverse, rehearse and rewatch some of these. Uh, I know I will because we have traveled quite a ways. 100 days with Jesus. My Lord, that is worth rehearsing some of that old content. So I'll be going back over that myself. So that'll be tomorrow. So I will announce that on tomorrow. So family, just want to say God bless you. I've enjoyed this journey with you all. And I look forward to bringing it to a conclusion on tomorrow. Well, family, continue to behold the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you.